Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Bob Lynn, and I will be the moderator of today's uh, session called Stop Runaway Inflation and Recession, Make America Produce Again. Uh, we're not going to waste any time here. We're going to get started right away and go and have Alfeka Mutardi kick this off. So Alfeka, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> My name is Alfeka Mutardi. I'm a macroeconomist. I worked for 25 years at the IMF and now um, I'd like to talk to you today about both our economy and how we can fix an impending economic disaster with our National Infrastructure Bank. So if we could go to the next slide, please. We think the economy is really in a very serious state right now. Uh, we have stagflation, of course. Uh, rampant inflation with the, the, the inflation rate running uh, at its highest level since the 1970s, 8.6%. Housing prices are way up. Uh, gas prices are at a record $5 a gallon. Wages are not keeping up with this uh, wage price spiral that's setting in. And high interest rates is two and a huge national debt with interest on the debt exploding. So this first quarter of this year, 2022, the, actually, the economy contracted by a little bit um, at 1.5% on an annual rate, and it's forecast not to grow very much in the second quarter either. And because of the inflation, the Federal Reserve is cracking down finally uh, to uh, accelerate interest rates and uh, tighten up on the monetary supply. This is almost surely uh, going to re, uh, result in a recession, especially because the Fed is increasing the rate at which it's doing this, having increased the interest rates much more than was anticipated. We also have a very tight labor market, which may be a saving grace for our economy, a very low uh, jobless rate and uh, 12 million job openings. But if you looked at the economy from another standpoint, that is uh, another different measure, that is the people of the percentage of people who are not working or seeking full-time uh, work because they're working part-time or earning below the poverty line, that, that, that share of our workforce is as high as 23%. So even though joblessness is low, we have a large portion of the population that is not very doing very well. And economists are divided now over whether we're going to enter into a recession. So it doesn't have to be the Sophie's choice, either the Fed clamps down and causes a recession, or the Fed does too little and we have stagflation, which really hurts everybody. There is a third solution, and I really want to tell you about how the National Infrastructure Bank can be this third solution. First of all, the NIB or the National Infrastructure Bank lends only to the real sector. Uh, it uh, is sized to cover $5 trillion in infrastructure projects over 10 years. Uh, it will uh, raise real wages because the workers who do this construction must be paid Davis-Bacon wages, uh, will train for permanent careers, and will also resolve supply chain problems like uh, ports and trucking and housing and other bottlenecks and will sharply raise economic growth. This is the true secret of the NIB. With higher growth and productivity, the economy is more efficient and actually reduces inflation because now we're producing more and uh, we're able to do it with fewer inputs uh, to do that production. And all this without any new federal spending, taxes or de deficit spending. So if we could go to the next slide, please. The bill in Congress, HR 33339, and what it would do would be to create a $5 trillion public bank to lend for infrastructure projects all across the country. And the reason we need a public bank is we're just not able to finance infrastructure, either through the federal budget, state and local budgets, municipal authorities, uh, uh, municipal authorities, we're not able to finance it uh, other than with a national infrastructure bank like this. We've had four banks in our nation past. They've been very successful. Uh, we now have 12 co-sponsors on our bill. Thank you very much for all the members of Congress who have signed on recently. We're aiming to try and get to 20 or 25 co-sponsors in the next 30 days. We've set that as an objective for ourselves before we go into a uh, recess uh, and uh, everybody's attention is paid, paid on elections. 
And so uh, part of the mobilization will see to, to be to see if we can get members of Congress, more members of Congress to sign on to our bill. So uh, if you could go to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, this is the way that the National Infrastructure Bank works. Uh, it is capitalized. It works on the model of the earlier four infrastructure banks. It's capitalized by getting, uh, bringing in treasuries from the private sector. Uh, anybody who's holding a treasury can invest in the National Infrastructure Bank, and they will get an equivalent of preferred stock that would pay these investors a little extra. That's to entice them to sell their treasuries into the NIB. And that extra stream of money will come out of the interest earnings from the NIB's loans with plenty of money left over to meet the bank's other operational needs. Uh, then the bank will go on, the capital will sit there on the bank's books, and then the bank will go on to give out a loan, and the loan process works exactly like a commercial bank does. Uh, the, every time the NIB books a loan, it creates money that increases the money supply, and then it uses its cash on hand to move that money through the banking system. Loans are very advantageous. We want to keep financing costs down. And borrowers would be public and uh, uh, public entities or states or local governments. Anybody that owns public infrastructure can come in for a loan. So this is what the bank covers. Five trillion in projects. And what you can see is that these are all hard infrastructure projects that will uh, invest into the real sector of our economy and um, raise economic growth in the process. So we'll be covering repairing mm -hmm. transportation systems, water systems, the electric power grid. We wanna make sure we put it on a sound footing. We'll build a high-speed rail network all across the country. And along those high-speed rail lines, we'll have more economic growth, get broadband in everywhere to connect rural and uh, urban America with the rest of the country build 7 million affordable housing units, boy, if that won't increase uh, economic growth and put them at the ends of transportation hubs so that people can get back to work efficiently and then build more water projects for the Southwest where we grow our nation's food. So that's it in a nutshell. And uh, we welcome all the rest of the speakers who are going to elaborate on ways that public banking can invest in the real sector and uh, the National Infrastructure Bank can help as well. Thank you. Thank you, Alfeca. Uh, next, we're going to uh, ask Dr. Nami uh, Prince uh, to speak. She's the author of Permanent Distortion, How the Financial Markets Abandoned the Real Economy Forever, and All the President's Bankers. She's a former managing director at Goldman Sachs, and she's a commentator on CNS, CNBC, Fox Business, CNN, MSNBC, New York Times. It, <clears throat> welcome. Uh, Dr. Prince. I was just ranting about gas prices, them not being, uh, being in California, them being uh, qu quite above the, the uh, national average of five. Um, there's a lovely shell station from uh, the center of Los Angeles to LAX airport where it's uh, routinely over seven um, and, and towards eight, but be that as it may. Um, you know, I, I think that the main problem, um, and there's many, of getting infrastructure projects to fruition to, to actually get to a point where not only are they complete, but where they can actually um, spur economic growth and, and um, solidity and equality um, is because they get abandoned somewhere between getting okayed, not getting okayed, getting partially funded, getting caught up in red tape um, and, and whatever else happens before they actually get complete. And we see this um, I see a lot of you are coming from all around the country. Um, there's probably 10, 20 or more so examples you could just think of in your own locale where, where that's the case. And so the idea of having um, the organization, and, and that's a key thing, uh, the organization of the finances for um, constructing, producing, completing, um, and, and working with um, what is required from the standpoint of, of um, importance is, is very key. And the fact that we have a national debt right now of over $30 trillion, we have $9 trillion of debt on the Federal Reserve's book of assets. So even though the Fed has pivoted towards raising rates recently, um, the reality is their book of assets is still quite... Um, anyway, the, the, idea, the idea is that if, if, if the organization of the finances for completion of projects that are, ne that are necessary 
um, that can produce economic growth is very important. And at a point where we have a $9 trillion Fed book, a $30 trillion overhang of national debt, a $23.5 trillion GDP, so a 130% debt to GDP ratio, um, we're in a situation where not enough is getting done with that debt to begin with. And so the idea of repurposing it and also leveraging it into actual projects where there's not a question of, well, I'll start now, but I can't finish because who knows when I'm gonna get financing and it has to go through tons of red tape from the local to the state to the national level on, on a regular basis. That's also um, batted about by elections and, and all sorts of other things that could happen in between um, and just the whims of financing um, is a problem. And that's why we're so behind. And, and I'll fact you have all the numbers on this um, more, more you know, on your fingertips and mine than I do, but the reality is we're super, super behind because we can't consistently finance things to completion. Or if we do, it's in a very sporadic or very, um, you know, sort of geographically disparate type of way. And so just having a, a general way of infusing financing into real economic growth, not monetary growth, reducing the uncertainty that is in the economy for good, not just when the Fed feels like it, not just when there's more money injected into the economy or rates are come down or rates go up and there's all sorts of um, tinkering on the edges in terms of the cost of money, but actually a flow that can actually get things done, um, then, then that's something that I think should be of interest to everybody. We're not creating new data, as Alfeca mentioned. We have a lot of debt to repurpose. Corporations have a lot of debt to repurpose. Um, it would actually keep a lot of problems out of the economy, if we could do that. Um, and we also can get things done and, and move forward. And that just helps um, everybody. Um, and so the idea of financing, kind of like Wall Street finances, but using it for public purposes and organizing it from a public perspective, your national bank, through public banking and so forth, is, is just a way to do that. So we can avoid having the same conversations. When I say we, I mean Congress, and I mean both sides of Congress, this should be appealing to both sides. Um, I know that at the moment, predominantly, there are Democrats on, on, uh, signed on to this, but we certainly had conversations with Republicans, and frankly, it shouldn't really matter um, who's who. Everyone lives, lives in, a, in a state that requires infrastructure to be completed. It really just doesn't matter um, how they position themselves on, on the polls. So that's kind of that in a nutshell. I mean, when I was on Wall Street, where I was for a number of years, I mean, that was just the way you got things done. You got things financed. Um, sometimes in a very bad and criminal way. So we're not going to talk about that. This isn't a very direct and transparent way, which is a big part of this, um, in a way that you can actually see projects to completion and get the returns back to um, the individuals, the corporations, and, and the uh, entities and government that are involved in the financing, and you actually see results. Thank you very much for that, uh, Nami, for that uh, opening to be able to do it so that we can uh, get a better understanding as we... Uh, uh, venture on to learn some more about this bank and how uh, we can become activated in that. So thank you. Uh, next, we're going to have Professor Robert Hockett, who's uh, from Cornell, uh, Professor of Law and Finance at Cornell University. He's a public, he sits a, on the public board, <coughs> the Public Institute Board of Directors, and is an advisor to federal and state legislatures, a former staff uh, member with the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and was with the International Monetary Fund. Uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Hockett, the floor is yours. Great, thanks so much, you guys. Um, an honor to be with you guys again. Uh, and thanks uh, again to Alfeca for uh, organizing this, this important meeting um, and maybe more broadly for organizing uh, the initiative um, in, a, in a larger sense, a more a macro sense. So uh, just a couple of things um, I think I'll emphasize uh, here. Um, I'll take my cue from Alfeca and start with uh, the inflation problem. Um, as you guys know, there's a, a tendency for people uh, more often than not to blame inflation solely on the money supply, right? Uh, and indeed, this often finds form uh, or finds expression in the old quote of uh, Milton Friedman's that people are fond of uh, trotting out anytime there's a, a looming inflation problem. Uh, and that was a quote to the effect that uh, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. The problem is that that quote itself is always and everywhere half true uh, and no more than half true. Uh, and the reason for that in turn is because inflation is always a relation. Right? It's a relation between money supplies, uh, sort of roughly speaking on the one hand and goods and services supplies on the other. In other words, the old adage that inflation is too much money chasing too few goods 
carries with it, right, an understanding that there's a relation between money supplies and goods supplies. And what that in turn means is if you have an inflation problem, there might indeed be, quote unquote, too much money, but there can also be too few goods, or there might be both. And all of the talk of late seems to have been about the money side of that particular relation. And seems there seems to be almost no talk at all about the goods and services side of that. Now, this is not a coincidence, um, and it's also not really a mystery as to why there might be uh, supply problems. Problems, right? On the one hand, we do, of course, have the more recent, the sort of shorter term um, uh, restrictions or constrictions of supplies by the so-called supply chain problems that the pandemic brought us and the pandemic highlighted. But in fact, the problem is actually of much longer vintage and has been going on for much longer than this. And it's basically been going on ever since the United States decided that it would be a good idea to have everybody else in the world produce the things that we use and that we purchase here. Ever since, in other words, we outsource production itself, um, apparently because those who control capital thought that they could produce more cheaply by exploiting uh, unprotected labor uh, in other jurisdictions abroad. Broad. So basically, in, in conducting a kind of end run uh, around labor protections, labor law, minimum wage laws, and the like, uh, corporate America has done a, a great job of basically seeing to it that the rest of the world does all the producing. Uh, and what that means in turn, then, is that as soon as you get uh, supply chain uh, problems such as those that the pandemic uh, prov uh, pre presented us with, we're suddenly faced with an incapacity to produce that which we need and that which we want to purchase, at least when it comes to sort of adequate quantities. Um, unsurprisingly, against that backdrop, when the Fed and when the Treasury in the early in early 2020 in response to the pandemic took necessary measures uh, to sort of un uh, provide support uh, to continued effective demand in order to prevent a sort of a replay of 2008, 2009, that turned out in the longer term, of course, to confront us with a good bit more money than was necessary to purchase the comparatively few goods that were available. To make a long story short, then, what we have to do now, obviously, is to jump, jump start and accelerate production. Uh, and we really have to, if we're really serious about this, we have to reshore production. We have to sort of undo a lot of the outsourcing and offshoring that was done over the course, starting in the 80s. And then, of course, the heyday of it was in the 1990s and early 2000s. We have to reverse that. In effect, then, we're faced with a sort of mobilization challenge, a productive mobilization challenge. Now, there are two times in the 20th century that we confronted mobilization of production challenges of a similar scale. One was the case of the First World War mobilization when it became clear that the US was going to enter into that war. And the second, of course, was the Second World War mobilization when it became clear that the US was going to enter into that war. Uh, and we seem to have found a model in the 20th century that was, in, in essence, a kind of 20th century update of the old Hamiltonian model, which can also be uh, viewed as having been updated by, by Samuel Chase and Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War as well. Uh, but the sort of modern incarnation of the Hamiltonian vision seems to, seems to involve sort of two distinct functionalities that we have to supply ourselves with. One is the sort of planning function where you need, or we can also call this the coordination function. You have to be able to coordinate a massive productive development project that's going to go on for some time between the public sector and the private sector on the one hand, and then you also have to coordinate it between various levels of governance on the other, right? So you have the federal level, you've got regional level uh, levels, you've got state levels, and you've got local levels. And you need some means of coordinating the big productive project across those levels, up and down, and then across public and private. You also, within private, within the private sector, you have to coordinate between industries or among multiple industries, right? Um, and that's a fairly massive undertaking, right? It requires a lot of organizational capacity, a lot of understanding of the interrelations and the interactions between efforts across industries, across regions, across states, and again, across levels of government. Now, the way that we handled that kind of, again, coordination function uh, in the case of the First World War mobilization was through a new entity that was called the War Industries Board. And the War Industries Board was a public agents or public entity, but what it did is it combined or brought together into one sort of deliberative body the expertises of people in different industries, both on the private sector side and on the public sector side when it came to sort of the regulatory agencies that oversaw those particular industries. 
but at the, and then when we got to the time of the Second World War, we did this through uh, a similar entity called the War Production Board. And the WPB, again, coordinated across industries and across levels of government, across the public and private sectors as well. So you had both of those, in both of those cases, you had a kind of coordinative body or co a coordinative capacity. The second functionality that we had in both cases was the financing functionality, a financing, we needed a financing capacity and that had to be a public sector capacity because as Nomi herself has, has especially well documented in her many distinguished works and as people who sort of observe the financial sector on the one hand and the industrial sectors on the other hand, uh, will you know have at least have an intuition, uh, an intuitive grasp of, there is a tendency for private sector money to flow where profits can be earned most quickly, right? And these days, thanks to the the financialization that has sort of accompanied and actually helped to sort of reinforce the sort of outsourcing and globalization that were the 90s and the early 2000s, what this means is that the tendency for money to go toward the financial markets and for the money to be basically spent in betting on price movements in secondary and tertiary markets, rather than actually investing in productive capacity building and production itself in what we can call the primary markets. And that's been the case that was, you know, there were sort of elements of this, or there were, there were sort of early antecedents of this sort of financialization pathology in the early 20th century. It's one reason that the Federal Reserve System was itself established in 1913. And of course, the same sorts of tendencies ran rampant in the 1920s. And there was similar worry that those tendencies might reemerge if the, if the nation began Again, uh, spending again in a big way in the mobilization for the Second World War at the end of the 1930s. So in the First World War, the sort of financing arm that was associated with the War Industries Board was called the War Finance Corporation, the WFC. Uh, and then similarly, uh, at the time of the Second World War, we made use of essentially a direct descendant of the WFC known as the RFC, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which is essentially established about two years after the WFC itself disbanded to help finance the New Deal. And then, of course, went into overdrive to help finance the Second World War mobilization. Now, what I would submit then is at the present juncture, we're faced with a sort of similar situation to that that we were faced by uh, in 1917 and in 1939. Uh, there is, in effect, a looming war again. But happily, in this case, it's not a sort of a war with guns and bullets and missiles and bombs, or at least we hope not. But it is a war on the one hand against the destruction of our climate and of our planet by climate change. And it's a war against gutted productive capacity because we simply don't have the kind of productive capacity that we used to have. And so a similar scale of mobilization is requisite. And I believe that in order to do that, the best way to do it is essentially to replicate that sort of two-part structure that served us so well in the First World War mobilization and the Second World War mobilization. And Alfeca and her, uh, her, her group, the, the coalition for an NIB, in effect, is providing us at least with the financial arm of this. It's providing us with the latter-day RFC, the latter-day Hamilton's First Bank of the United States, the latter-day WFC as well, and the latter-day quartermaster general's office that helped basically guide the financing of the civil war during the Lincoln administration. Uh, what we have when it comes to sort of coordinating, there is another uh, uh, option on the table that would be complementary to that of the NIB. Uh, and that's a piece of legislation that you'll be hearing more about within a couple of weeks. Um, if you want a kind of preview of the basic content of it, you could Google my name and then uh, National Reconstruction and Development Council uh, or National Reconstruction and Development Act of 2021. It's a draft bill that I put together about a year and a half ago, um, a version of which will be introduced into Congress quite soon. The idea here is to form, again, a kind of coordinative council that combines on the one hand, the White House or the president, let's say, and the vice president and the Fed chair and the treasury secretary, but also all of the heads of all of the cabinet level agencies with primary jurisdiction over the nation's principal industries and infrastructures on the one hand, along with certain counterparts of these folk from state level uh, agencies or state government and some local government, and then various private sector representatives as well from the principal industries whose factories are going to have to be churning out the new infrastructures and the new basic industrial capacities 
of the, the near term future. So we're talking the solar industry or the emerging solar energy uh, industry, the emerging wind power industry, the emerging hydropower industry, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You see where this is going. So the idea here is then the National Reconstruction and Development Council would basically be a ladder day version of the War Production Board or the War Industries Board, uh, and it would complement then the National Infrastructure Bank, which would be a latter-day rendition of the RFC and the WFC. Um, and that, I think, is probably where I should leave it. I could go on and on about this. I'm kind of enthused, as you probably gathered, but um, we've been given strict marching orders uh, to sort of limit our, our time. So uh, I'll close it uh, there, and uh, we'll look forward to any sort of discussion that we have afterwards. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Professor. Uh, quite interesting how uh, things are <coughs> new again, as uh, they say, uh, reinvent the wheel. We don't have to reinvent it. We just have to go back in history and, and uh, reincorporate it again. So <coughs> moving on. Uh, next, we have Ellen Brown, who's the founder and chair of the Public Banking Institute. And she's also the author of Web of Debt, She's a media commentator, including SharePost.com. She's from Los Angeles, California. Welcome, Alan Brown. Thank you. Okay, so what I ooh, what I particularly want to talk about is um, where will we get the money to fund this five trillion dollars in infrastructure, and uh, so we'll get it where banks uh, get their money generally and where all of our money supply actually comes from, which is they create it as bank credit on their books. According to the Bank of England, commercial banks create money in the form of bank deposits by making new loans. In fact, said the Bank of England, the, these bank deposits created by banks on their books make up 97% of the amount of money currently in circulation, as you can tell from this chart, where bank created money is the part of the mountain in red. Uh, so this is not some new or untested way of creating of funding infrastructure. It's how it's been done for hundreds of years quite successfully. So starting in the US, going back to the American system, which was um, sovereign money and credit. In other words, money and credit created by the government itself, uh, which allowed the American colonists to escape the British colonial system. The British thought that the purpose of colonies was to create um, resources for the mother motherland and that was not not the idea of the American colonists but they didn't have money of their own so um so the colony of Massachusetts first got the idea of issuing these um paper receipts called um bills of credit which were were issued to um people who supplied goods and services to the government supposedly in advance against taxes but the problem was that uh, it was a lot easier to issue the money than to pull it back in taxes. So it did have the downside that the, the currency tended to uh, devalue, which inflated the prices until uh, the colony of Pennsylvania came up with the idea of creating a bank. So instead of just issuing the money and spending it, it was issued as loans. So it went out and it came back, which meant it was a sustainable closed loop system. According to Adam Smith, uh, Pennsylvania's papal currency is said never to have sunk below the value of gold and silver, which was quite amazing. It retained its value. Uh, <clears throat> and that worked until the king forbade it, of course. And then uh, we, the money supply contracted and we wound up with, in the American Revolution, the, the, Amer the colonists rebelled. And again, they funded their participation in the war just with these little paper receipts, bills of credit. Uh, and won the war, which was quite amazing. Won, the, won a war against the world's major power. Benjamin Franklin said, the whole is a mystery even to the politicians, how we could pay with paper that had no previous fixed fund appropriated specifically to redeem it. And yet they won. But um, the problem again was that the Continental by the end of the war had devalued virtually to zero. Uh, largely because it was easy to counterfeit and the uh, British were, had counterfeited it massively. So at the end of the war, the colonies, which now became the states, uh, were $44 million in debt, which was a huge sum at the time. So it was quite controversial whether the federal government should undertake to pay this debt, but uh, Alexander Hamilton won the debate. Uh, his idea was that we would pay for it 
by allowing uh, state debt to be accepted in partial payment for stock in the first U.S. bank. So these were debt for debt for equity swaps, and then the bank leveraged the cap its capital into credit. Again, the credit was issued just as paper currency. I mean, now we do it on the books of the bank, but then it was paper currency. So this was our first official um, currency. And uh, this was done on the fractional reserve model. Uh, Hamilton wrote, it is a well-established fact that banks in good credit can circulate a far greater sum than the actual quantum of their capital in gold and silver. In other words, you could a dollar of reserves would allow you to issue $10 in loans. Um, and th that was also the model of the Bank of England, but unlike the Bank of England, uh, under Hamilton's system of public credit, the function of the bank would be to issue credit for internal improvements and other economic development. So it's basically a development bank. And so is the second US bank on the same model. Uh, pr probably the most uh, impressive achievement was funding the Erie Canal. But um, um, that, that bank too was shut down. And then President Lincoln, when he got into office was faced with a uh, a, a war and he was going to have to borrow from the British bankers at something like 30% interest. <laughs> so it's quite, quite, quite high interest. They would wind, we would wind up heavily in debt at the end of the war. So he re, re, ver, resorted to the American system again. He issued paper money, which are called greenbacks. He actually doubled the money supply in greenbacks and his government um, under Chase founded the national bank system. So in order to become a national bank, uh, you had to capitalize your, your bank or your bank notes that would be issued uh, with government debt. And so you can see you got to say United States of America on your bank notes. Um, and these two sources of new money funded not only the war effort, but rapid economic development, including the, oops, yeah, including the Transcontinental Railroad, which actually returned a profit to the government. And uh, according to Milton Friedman, this, although the money supply was doubled, it did not create pr uh, price inflation. There was some price inflation during the war, as there always is during wartime because of shortages. But as you can see from this chart, well, you can't see the whole chart, but it just inflation shoots up at the end after 1971, which as we know is when the dollar went off the gold standard. Um, and other, other uh, former um, British colonies followed the Hamilton, money, uh, ha Hamil Hamilton model as well in, in founding national banks, including Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. I don't have time to go into it, but they're quite interesting models. I've written about those. Uh, <clears throat> but in the US, what we got was the Federal Reserve, which did not work quite the same way. And we, of course, we wound up in the Great Depression in the 1930s. Uh, the whole world wound up in the Great Depression. But uh, uh, Roosevelt pulled us through the Depression with another Hamiltonian financial institution. It started it was the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. So it started with $500 million in capitalization. It issued bonds. And over the next 25 years, it loaned or invested over $40 billion and uh, rebuilt the country through the New Deal and funded um, much of the US participation in World War II. And at the end of all that, it turned a profit for the government. Uh, Canada did something similar with the Bank of Canada. I can't go into that. Um, <clears throat> and today, the most impressive model is China, which has been the fastest growing economy in the world in the last 40 years. That's the red line shooting up there. So how did they do it? Um, <clears throat> they, they went from one of the poorest countries in the world to a global uh, economic powerhouse. They did it through in massive banks. In three, they had three massive development banks, and the government owns 80% of Chinese banking assets. So the, the, the government would, for example, build high-speed rail or dams or power stations by issuing bank credit. And then the um, fees from what was built with the loans would go back and repay the loans. So again, a sustainable system. Um, 
And over the last 23 years, the China, Chinese money supply has grown by 1,800%. That's by a factor of 18, which is incredible. And yet, prices have remained stable, as you can tell from these two charts. The top one is the money supply, and the second one is prices. Why? Because their uh, GDP went up at the same rate. So you have uh, supply and demand going up and together, up together. And so, as Bob points out, that it, it all stayed in balance, and prices remain stable. That's all I got. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Ellen. Um, next, we have Assemblyman Felix Ortiz, a former Assistant Speaker with the New York Assembly co-founder and former chairman of the National Hispanic Caucus of State Legislatures from Albany, New York. Assemblyman Felix Ortiz, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you and thank you and good evening, everybody. Thank you for having me and another wonderful event. I think uh, we have wonderful speakers uh, here tonight. I am, and I'm very, very moved by uh, Dr. Prince and Professor Hockett I think that uh, your presentations really, I wish I would be elected, I was elected by now and have both of you and, uh, and Alveca really giving me all this material to run with it. Uh, I, do, uh, I do appreciate really the kind of work that, uh, that, that everyone has been doing. And Ms. Brown, Ellen Brown with uh, her articulation as always, um, her presentation, uh, bringing me back to the past and bring me to the present and the future. So I think that one of the most important thing is talking about following on Dr. Uh, Hockett, Hockett's uh, comments about mobilization one and two, now we need to do mobilization number three, which has been we had to mobilize ourselves uh, to make sure that we can take on Congress in the last three or five weeks that they have left uh, to make sure that they be able to learn and to uh, articulate uh, what we're trying to do here. And one of the well, one other thing that I would like to uh, to point out is that I was the first legislator who introduced the first resolution uh, of the National Infrastructure Banking back about five years ago. Uh, at uh, when uh, Stuart came to me to uh, uh, educate me, if you will, about this, I I did literally say to him, "Get out of my office! I don't know what you're talking about." And then over the sun, I called him back and I said, "Come back here! I think this would make completely sense." Let's, uh, let's try to do a resolution. As you all know, uh, you know I've been saying this uh, from the beginning, one of the art of politics in New York State is that the Speaker of the Assembly and the President of the Senate, they both have a very unique way of doing business where they would not put a resolution call calling on Congress to do ABCD. So you, you, know, you do have to fight by having um, by putting into perspective and creating a coalition from the bottom up, which has been talking to city councils, talking to county legislators, where the city council and the county legislator that I use in order to present their own resolutions uh, and in their respective uh, uh, political spectrum to call the state legislator to do something was the opposite. So calling us, so, so I'm the one presenting the resolution, but now I'm talking to my colleagues at the local level to make sure that they will be able to push me to do something, <laughs> which is a, which is amazing art, you know. Uh, but uh, we we managed to we managed to put the pressure to the legislator. We managed even to put the bill, I'm uh, sorry, the resolution, even in the in a committee, in government in the governmental committee, which is got killed after all. But the bottom line here is that uh, we do have uh, we do have a, a magnitude of information and magnitude for intellect individual here that we should be working together to ensure that we will be able to reach out to our congressional delegation uh, in every respective state and trying to educate them. You know, we understand that our, uh, um, the, the elections in New York, for example, about Congress, the Congress is uh, being moved to August 23rd. Uh, you may have Congress people running against each other, which is fun to see. Uh, and I think it's important, not only fun to see, but it's also fun to see where is their position in the National Infrastructure Banking? You know, why Congress hasn't really uh, pay attention to what we're talking about um, when in reality, the National Infrastructure Banking is uh, have one main purpose and is to develop the economy and the security of our local state and nation. And nation. That's it, that's, that's, you know, that's, that's the main objective of all this. And furthermore, we won't be able to pay taxes. 
And I think the, the, the big, uh, you know, when you talk to politicians, and I used to work for Ed Koch uh, at the mayor's office uh, when I was the uh, uh, senior budget analyst, and I always will come to the mayor and I say to him, well, you know, why do we have to increase uh, revenue? And where should we look for revenue? He said to me, that's your job. I'm a politician. I will tell you whether or not I'm getting reelected uh, or I want to be reelected based on your recommendations. So when you get the recommendations, recommendation becomes to be political uh, and uh, based on whether or not I can be reelected. The same thing happened with the Congress. The Congress right now, they all are handcuffed. Uh, handcuffed in a way that every day is a different new issue. You know, two years ago, we have the pandemic. Now we're talking about uh, abortion. Now we're talking about gun control. Now we're talking about wasting our time in, in probably trying to figure out what really happened in January 6. It's not a wasting of time, but I'm saying that, that you know, every single day is something different in Congress. It, it's, my father used to say that life's changing every second. Every second life change. And if, if we believe that life's changing every second, we should not take Congress for granted and we should mobilize ourselves for June 30 to have an independent voice, an independent mobilization to call on Congress to make sure that they will be able to act in this so important HR 3339 and become to be co sponsors. Otherwise, you should be fired in November election. Thank you very much and let's give the faith. <laughs> and and uh, it, can you bring that back up, Mark? That uh, flyer there? That, uh, just just so everyone's aware of what uh, what's happening here, we're going to have an, another uh, Zoom town hall on Thursday, June thirtieth at eight p.m. and we're calling it the Independence Day Holiday Mobilization. And we what the whole goal here is is to try to gather up more more co-sponsors. Right now we have twelve. For for the longest time we had one and two, and then. Some, some momentum actually picked up and we started to be able to, to gather a few more Congress people by actually going and talking to our own legislatures and asking them to start to do it. New Mexico did a fantastic job. Michigan has gotten a couple to be able to do it. Uh, what we are need to do is we all need to challenge ourselves to be able to go and start actually knocking on the doors and, and reaching out to our Congress people again. Uh, this is going to have to be a groundswell. There is it not gonna cut from the top. There's no way this is coming from the top down. This is going to be a bottom up project that we have to do to be able to make it happen. And, and we are the ones that, that, that actually do it. I'm a firm believer and I've, if you've been on any calls with me in the past, you've heard me say, if we build the parade, the politicians will run to the front and take credit for it. I, I guarantee it and lead us as soon as we build the parade. But if we don't build the parade, they will not come. And so we are the ones, we're the foot soldiers to be able to make this happen. And so it's very important for us to be able to do that. And so I encourage you to make sure that you put this on your um, calendar uh, for Thursday, June 30th, uh, because we're going to really discuss about how do we go about actually going and talking to our congressman or, or congresswoman to be able to get them signatory to this and try to really gain some momentum to be able to do it. And I think, uh, you know, I, I found it very interesting with Professor Hockett when he was talking about how it needs to be two prong. And, and I, I'll tell you, the financing part is really important, but we have to have the other part too to be able to do it. It has to be a, a you have to have both pieces in order to make this happen. I know our focus has been strictly on trying to make sure the bank is there and we've built a lot of, of safeguards into the uh, legislation, et cetera. But we all know that legislation as it goes forward kind of gets chopped up a little bit. But I think if we make sure that we go and be able to do that type of a, a, an opportunity, I think we really have uh, a real good uh, chance to really uh, start to focus this country back I'm bringing production back here and starting making things again, where we can start to be able to become much more self-sufficient to be able to do it. I think it's important that every country is self-sufficient to be able to do it, that they don't have to rely on everybody to be able, some other uh, entity to be able to do it. It's important for all of us to work towards that. So I, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna throw the floor open for questions and how we're gonna do it is I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand and then I'm gonna call on you 
And as we go through, uh, I'll toss it up to our uh, experts and we'll see what we can do to be able to uh, get that. So we're gonna start with Pablo and Jane Vigil. So Pablo, the floor is yours. Uh, yeah, thank you for uh, calling on me. Uh, my pet uh, project would be to bring water from uh, Canada and Lake, the Great Lakes into the uh, Colorado Basin and the Rio Grande Basin of New Mexico. And that is uh, buying water from Lake Winnipeg and Lake Superior and pumping it to the Green River in uh, Wyoming and then filling up uh, Lake Powell and Lake Mead and also pumping the water to uh, the Rio Grande Basin and filling up the dams in the Rio Grande Basin of New Mexico. And, uh, you know, uh, charging people for the water, that would pay for the project in itself, you know, if we can provide the water. But my question is, how do we spearhead this project? How do, who takes the lead? Who says, okay, we're gonna take, uh, go to Canada and ask them if we can buy their water, go to uh, the Great Lakes and see how we can uh, pump the water. That's my question is who would uh, take the lead on that? Okay, well, I'm gonna, First, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw that. To, it sounds like it's a, a Professor Hockett question to me to at least take the first stab at, at giving us uh, his opinion. So, Professor. Yeah, I'm I'm guessing that um, I mean because that would be a, a, a cross border or a cross national sort of project. That would be an ideal thing for um, something like a national development council or a national reconstruction council uh, to evaluate for one thing to see whether it's you know a good idea or in the interests of the country to kind of pursue this, um, and then to sort of figure out how to do it if we did decide to do it in a manner that is not disruptive uh, to other industries or isn't unfair to other localities or other states or regions. Um, and that, of course, comports with um, international treaty obligations and, and, and the like. Um, it's, it's exactly the kind of, on the one hand, localized, but on the other hand, nationally significant project that would be, that a council of this sort would be designed to sort of um, deal with, right? Because again, it's a sort of a, it's a massive complex uh, puzzle in a sense to uh, develop across the board or redevelop across the board and across industries and across regions um, in manners that are sort of optimally graceful, you might say, and that, that don't operate at sort of cross purposes. I mean, just to give you a kind of concrete example of the kind of um, foul up that can happen if you're not coordinating. I mean, if you put a lot of money, let's say, into investing into you know, mass um, electric vehicle production, um, but you don't have any sort of a plan in place for charging stations um, at optimal locations and the like, well, then there won't have there won't be there will be, there will not have been much point in doing all of that EV production. Similarly, if you have embark on a massive EV production uh, program, but you haven't done anything about rare earths metals of the kind that go into that production, or if you don't have anything in the way of battery production or any kind of a plan for the uh, production of batteries and and at all four or five stages of the production process for those things. Again, the, the EV plan itself will be kind of a, a non-starter or kind of stillborn. So there's a sort of massive puzzle that has to be solved in the sense that you've got a lot of moving parts that have to be dealt with together. Um, and a, a water movement uh, project of the kind uh, that Pablo just mentioned seems to me exactly the same sort of thing, right? It's the same kind of project in the sense that it does involve lots of different moving parts. And you'd need some sort of a coordinated council to, to do this. I would also add just finally in closing that um, we, we also wouldn't want to adopt projects that, um, it, let's say you've got a part of the country that's um, overusing water uh, or that's wasting uh, water. And so then it runs out of water. It drains a water table or what have you. I don't know that trying to get it from Lake Winnipeg then and sort of taking Canadians water away from them would be a long-term solution either. Um, and so basically, again, the, the sort of long-term planning would have to involve 
you know, looking at how, you know, sort of particular uses of water, whether we're doing this as efficiently as possible, whether we're not wasting and so forth. Um, in any event, that's, I guess, those are the kinds of questions I would sort of be posing if I were addressing um, a project of that kind. All right, thank you for that. Uh, uh, next, we're gonna ask uh, Michael I have, I have one more comment uh, saying that uh, sure. the water from the Great Lakes, most of it, uh, I don't know what percentage of it, most of it flows into the St. Lawrence River and then eventually into the ocean. So, I mean, we wouldn't be uh, taking that much uh, water from the Great Lakes because most of it goes to the ocean anyway. So that's my comment too. Thank you for that, Pablo. Next, we're gonna ask Michael Savante. Uh, you're, you're next up on the floor. Uh, the floor is yours, please ask your question. Sure. First of all, real quick, um, hi to both Bob and Ellen. It's been a while since I talked with both of you. Um, uh, the key question I've got, I know a number of uh, congressional folks that uh, we're working with already in a very parallel sense. And so who do I connect up with to be able to try and uh, integrate what we're doing and who we're connect connected with, with what you're doing with the NLV effort? Uh, what what exact can if if you wouldn't mind can you explain a little bit more about what when you say what you're doing? I, well, first of I, all, I'm in I'm in Youngstown, and so okay. that's where Tim Ryan is, okay. and so he's my congressman, and I've been dealing with Sherrod Brown for quite some time, and we have a number of others in Congress that we're dealing with in connection with a whole economic development concept that's very um, uh, connectable to this whole NIB concept and could help to actually reinforce it. And so there's the potential of uh, you know, reinforcement concept. So I'm trying to find out who within your group I should reach out to, to you know, get connected up with, to see about that collaboration. Okay, well, I, I'm gonna uh, ask uh, Alfeca if she wouldn't mind just getting on real quick to talk about this and say that and then, um, I will have uh, Nami say something. So, Alfeca. Great, thank you very much. And um, uh, at the probably at the end of our th thing, we're going to uh, put a slide up on how you can help. Um, but we have a coalition for National Infrastructure Bank. The website is nibcoalition.com. There are phone numbers on there. Uh, you can sign up uh, to, uh, you know, get materials or um, see how you can write uh, letters to your members of Congress. Um, or you can organize meetings, and we we do these kinds of um, presentations to to staffers and uh, congresspersons all the time. So uh, we can help to organize. We've already been in touch with uh, uh, preliminarily with uh, Tim Ryan and Sherrod Brown's offices. We're very much looking for a Senate version uh, to to go along a companion bill to go along with HR three 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 nine in the House. Uh, and we definitely want to have uh, members of the Ohio delegation sign on. And we also are very interested in doing economic development to refurbish and retool, use the same RFC procedures to take over, um, you know, or and or uh, that RFC used to take over and or buy uh, abandoned warehouses in the state of Ohio to build uh, um, uh, windmill turbines or rail cars or whatever it takes to build our infrastructure because all of it must be made in America. And so we want to, want to refurbish manufacturing and that's a, a way that we'll do it um and and i hope bob you're going to get to the question that's on the chat about how yep. to do production on uh, without hurting the environment too uh well, so uh so uh, go on to our website nibcoalition.com there's some phone numbers on there and you can uh call up and we can get together and do some presentations to your uh congressional delegations all right uh that next question i was going to ask if uh if uh, NAMI would take it. And uh, they're talking about how do we do production? <clears throat> how do we ramp up production without damaging the, uh, the, <clears throat> the ecology? How do we make sure that uh, um, we don't destroy our civilization while we ramp up to be able to, how, what are some of the ways we could do that? So NAMI, if, if you wouldn't mind. Um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's no me. Um, but so, Oh, I'm sorry. No, 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 that that's fine. It happens literally all the time. Um, I just wanted to just, uh, before saying anything on that, um, Rick mentioned, um, Hazel, 
And, um, you know, I think that Hazel Henderson, who just recently passed um, away, and I'm sure everyone, if not almost everyone here knows um, who she was and what she did. Um, and also in terms of what she did with uh, the organization Ethical Markets. And I think it's also relevant to this question because I think you can, um, in that spirit and in general, uh, direct funds in such a way that they're sustainable, renewable, clean, and efficient. There's, there's, there doesn't have to be a disconnect. And, and to, and to Bob's point, um, can I say Bob, Rob, Pocket? How do you want that done? <laughs> Bob is fine, Nomi. That's always okay. fine. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate. Sure. Um, uh, um, the, you know, to his point about, um, you know, EVs and 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 requiring in order to just as an example, in order to be able to sort of grow that element of electrification and and also to do it in a way that's um, more sustainable and certainly more productive for the U.S. You know, we need to basically be helping um, mechanisms of getting rare earth minerals, doing things internally, and having more control. Therefore over um, how clean they are from the standpoint of the environment. I was just out in Texas for um, a number of meetings between Austin and Dallas. And one of the things that's interesting about Texas, aside from, um, you know, is, is this is this a pivot from, um, you know, it's still being very much the preeminent, you know, sort of oil producing capital of the United States, but also being the number one wind production, um, you know, from the standpoint of wind production and new power. Um, and so there is a transition between, um, you know, sort of current power and new power that also, um, to one of Bob's other points, recognizes that that um, there's investment that goes there too. And if we get back to this idea of, you know, how do you get Congress people on board, if that is our, our goal for this particular initiative, you know, how do we get signups? How do we get like backing where, you know, people who are not already, the 12 people not already signed up, the rest of them can say, you know what, this is a good idea. And I'm not afraid um, because Congress does to a large extent uh, operate on not being afraid in order to actually do something um, of, of getting behind this because it makes sense. Why does it make sense? Because there's a lot that we need to do. Everybody knows that. There's a lot that right now, particularly what happens um, happened in the Ukraine, what's going on with more of a competitive stance towards China that was under the Trump administration and under the Biden administration um, and this idea of producing at home, whether that's deploying the Defense Production Act or whatever it is. So the idea I think that can cross parties um, and also allow momentum on clean, uh, clean air, efficiency, sustainability, and renewability, and, and doing what we need to do in a way that preserves our environment and our ecology and our future um, also connects into this, this idea of allowing for ownership of the idea of financing these initiatives through, um, through Congress people that so far have not signed on. And in that respect, um, it's about, it does come down to being about the money. Um, and if they agree, any one of them agrees that there isn't enough money to do what they believe needs to be done within the state in which they get reelected, then there's a path for that particular Congress person to sign up to something that actually is a mechanism to fund that last mile, that last 10 miles, that last you know, half a state or whatever it might be to continuing development, whether it's production, whether it's um, you know, so local sustainability, whether it's national sustainability. So I, I, I really see our, our current pivot right now is, is, is the need um, for, for the, the new energy that, that a lot of us here have been talking about for decades coming to a fruition. And the idea being that um, it, can, it isn't fruition across the aisle. It just needs people across the aisle to take ownership and to have the courage and the boldness to understand that Financing is needed, extra financing beyond the $1.2 billion bipartisan infrastructure act and so forth. And this is a way to do it. And, and the agreement is about a way to finance the projects that we need to actually produce and grow here, which will ultimately get back to all the things we we're talking about in the beginning. It will reduce the inflation of things that we don't control supply chains for because we actually can create and produce and build at home because we have the financing in place to complete those projects. Thank you very much, Nomi. I apologize for mispronouncing your name there. Uh, Evelyn, uh, your hand is raised, Evelyn Vinogradov. Yes, I'm that's, sure I that's that. you, you did not. That is very well said. Um, I am from New Mexico. Uh, I'm the chair of the Democratic Party of New Mexico's Rural Caucus. Um, I, I'd like to make just two quick comments and then I have a, a short question. Um, I see there are several people from New Mexico here, and I'm, I'm quite proud of that. Um, 
we in New Mexico seem to, to um, have really worked on this, uh, getting you some sponsors. I would like to hit the trifecta, however, and see if one, uh, our third Congresswoman, Yvette Harrell, who is a Republican, could uh, possibly be contacted to sign on. I know that um, our two Congress people, Melanie Stansbury and Teresa Ledger Fernandez, uh, were approached by State Senator Bill Tallman, who is has been instrumental in um, in publicizing the National Infrastructure Bank, et cetera. So I very much appreciate that. Um, my question is: We in New Mexico have been um, have been talking about a state infrastructure bank similar to the one in North Dakota. I believe North Dakota is the only state of the 50 who, who has a state bank. So how would this initiative work, the National Infrastructure Bank work in uh, coordination with the state bank system? Uh, could they work together? Would they be competing with each other? I'm quite new to the mechanics of all of this and I would love to hear a comment on how a state bank could be, um, could be put into the mix. Thank you. Okay, Alan Brown, it sounds like it's right up your uh, alley. <laughs> okay, thanks. Well, um, ideally, uh, uh, the infrastructure bank will issue credit as banks all do, but in, when, the, when the borrowers pull the money out of the bank for whatever they're gonna spend it on, you need deposits from somewhere. So one possibility would be a national postal banking system, which would be great. Uh, another possibility is a, a public banking system across the across the country, or just local local banks in general. Um, so I know that the NIB is set up as a depository bank, but it's not totally clear <laughs> where the deposits come from. Um, so maybe I'll ask Alfeka on that. What do you think? Yeah. Alfeka. Yeah, thanks. We, we've had a lot of discussions with uh, people who are supporting public banks in Washington State, New Mexico, elsewhere, New Jersey, um, Rhode Island, uh, and we see them working together uh, as follows. Uh, as Ellen Brown says, the NIB will need deposits to circulate its uh, newly created uh, money around through the rest of the banking system. One way to do that is possibly the NIB could act as a correspondent bank for public banks. That is, uh, it it's, uh, would be their, their check a clearing mechanism for them and hold their deposits. That's one way to bring them in. Another way to bring in deposits is just to offer a little bit more than the regular banking system offers on interest uh, for deposits. And then a third way is possibly postal banking. All those things are still up in the air. We see also another synergy between the NIB and um, uh, state public banks. The state public banks can even act as a storefront for the NIB. With their loan officers, they know they will be knowing their uh, their state officials better than anybody. Uh, they will um, know what projects need to be uh, run out and uh, they could act as a storefront for a service fee for the NIB to, to take on the initial uh, application for a loan. And then there's going to be all kinds of secondary business coming out of the NIB's operations. We call the secondary uh, thrust onto the economy from the NIB operations to build infrastructure. You'll need all kinds of secondary economic activities activity to support it. And those, uh, those uh, local public banks can um, use their uh, local deposits to lend out credit to start all kinds of new small businesses and things like that in their area. So there, we see a lot of synergy between the, the, the NIB, of course, will be doing really large mega projects maybe across uh, state lines, maybe something like high-speed rail projects and those kinds of things. And then the small, smaller public banks could um, do um, either smaller projects or infrastructure projects, or they could do uh, um, uh, the, the, sec the, the small business loans that will come out of the secondary um, e economic activity. Thanks, Could I add, uh, yeah. you need Go the ahead, local then. banks, you need local banks at the local level. That's the way the Chinese do it. That's the way the Germans have done it because you need to know your local markets and yeah. it's not possible for one giant national bank to know what's going on all over the country. So. Yeah, it's worth, it's worth yeah. noting in this connection, you guys, really, really quickly, um, when the Fed sort of was briefly uh, helping out or were trying to help out small businesses um, in early 2020, 
uh, in response to the pandemic, the bank that did the best in helping the Fed find uh, worthy beneficiaries was the Bank of North Dakota. Uh, and the, the Bank of North Dakota so far outperformed private sector banks in helping the Fed to find, again, appropriate recipients of that largesse, that even the Wall Street Journal noted this and, and basically published the records, uh, the sort of track records of the various banks that had basically served as the storefronts, as Alpeca put it, or as the sort of local affiliates, so to speak, as Ellen put it. Uh, and again, the Bank of North Dakota far outperformed all of the private sector banks. And so that seems to me to, to sort of bode well um, for uh, state, pro uh, state public banks role uh, in a, an NIB sort of system. Thank you for that. Uh, Ruth Fruland. Uh, you're next on the floor. Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, hi, I'm from, I'll start out, I'm from Washington State uh, with a group, uh, Washingtonians for Public Banking, uh, newly formed. And my uh, question uh, to uh, both uh, Nomi and Robert and Ellen um, is basically, I like what you said, Robert, about thinking in terms of all the other things, if you're talking about electrical cars, well, I'm, I think what we're talking about with these different pieces, local, state, national, what needs, what are those pieces to make this public banking work as if it were a war effort, as if it were um, NASA deciding to go to the moon. So we, we want public banks, we want a public bank movement uh, and we need them at all levels. So. What would the pieces be? What would they look like if we we're going to, you know, white paper start from ground up and see if we can reverse engineer or forward engineer, whichever it is, <laughs> to help all of us? <laughs> okay, now, Nomi, if you want to take that first. Well, um, I, I think from the public banking standpoint, and um, and Ellen's been so so instrumental in driving um a lot of everything that constitutes a white paper or different color paper, um, is that you do need that, that idea of funding and that idea of being able to leverage um, from seed funding, which can be bonds, um, can be treasury bonds, can be local bonds, can be municipal bonds, um, can be specific bonds. Um, in, in the case of the NIB, the idea there is effectively you're financing based on existing uh, treasury bonds, but that can also water down into um, into state in, into local bonds. But the idea is that you have seed money and that money is basically used as sort of collateral um, as banking goes for the larger projects. And then in order to get money um, back for the investors, quote, the people that are pledging or the companies or the states or the localities or the communities or the national government um, to basically get repaid on that, um, then you're looking at the, um, the returns a long way down the line, um, depending on the project of what's coming in based on each project. And so there is a there is a chain that starts with um, investment all the way from local to community to state to national um, of existing debt or effectively of trading existing debt for um, an additional return on that debt. Um, for example, in national infrastructure bank structure, um, in a public banking structure, the idea is that you can actually um, funnel that funnel that money into public projects. Um, and so that basically then goes back to allowing those public projects to grow the economies um, from, from a public standpoint on up, from a foundational perspective on up, and then that repays um, the money that's basically been used to seed the projects themselves. So it's the same kind of circle that banks use when they even look at a mortgage. So they have money from depositors, they basically leverage it 10 to one, or in some cases, you know, the financial crisis, like 100 to one, but you know, be that as it may, that they leverage it into um, other types of projects. And then on that basis, the returns come back to the initial um, seed money, the initial um, depositors, um, or in this case, the additional lenders um, or the additional bondholders at that bottom level. So it, it works in both cases, like a bank, the difference, like, like, a, like, as we know, regular commercial banks or investment banks, the difference is the money's actually getting used for direct activities that actually help the real economy, as opposed to the speculative economy, as opposed to the market and paper and financial economy. And, and that's the main difference of it all. Thank you for that. Robert, do you have something to add? 
Uh, just um, just really quickly, um, one of the, the most impressive things about the Second World War production mobilization was that they sort of thought through everything that would be needed um, on the supply end of production, right? So um, they thought, okay, well, look, we need more factories for one thing. We need more production facilities. Private sector entities are sort of too risk averse to sort of build those things. So we'll publicly build them. So they created a defense plant corporation to build the plants. And then they said, we'll keep ownership, but we'll lease them out cheaply uh, to the companies that produce within them. Um, so this was, the, this was called the GOCO model, right? Government owned, company operated. But then they thought, well, gosh, there's gonna be a workforce working there. And are there neighborhoods that are adequate to house everybody? Well, apparently not because they're gonna have massive they're going to be massive workforces at many of these factories. So they created a defense housing corporation to build entire neighborhoods for the workforce. And then they thought, gosh, well, they're going to need power, um, you know, sort of flowing into these neighborhoods. And they're going to need schools if these workers have children. And they're going to need healthcare facilities and clinics. And so they basically built everything that was necessary, essentially, to create an entire little economy from scratch in each locality where there was going to be something like that to happen. Now, if we're talking about public banking in Washington state, it's a somewhat smaller scale that we're talking about than an entire nation sort of producing in order to defeat, you know, to be the arsenal of democracy or whatever. But it's a similar mode of thinking, right? You sort of think about everything that plays a role in the production chain or the establishment chain um, when you're going to create a bank uh, or a banking system of this kind and think it all through in advance and then sort of plan for it. I think that's the best way to do it. And then you don't, you know, you don't come up with any sort of unpleasant surprise or everything. Oh my God, we didn't think of that. And now, you know, the linchpin is missing or the art, you know, the sort of keystone is missing. So the thing, the structure isn't going to stand. If you think it all through carefully, um, it seems to me that you, you can't lose. Okay. Uh, next, Jim, I'm sorry, somebody, go ahead. Jim, Jim Handley, um, you're next up on the floor with your question, Jim. Unmute. It's great to be here. It's great to see Ellen and uh, our friends in New Mexico. <clears throat> I'm the co-director of Arizonans for a New Economy, and uh, I'm very stimulated by this discussion about the NIB. Uh, the question I have, and, and I, I apologize if it has been already addressed. I joined a little bit late. question I have, as I hear um, speakers here talk about projects that they'd like to see, infrastructure projects that they'd like to see. <clears throat> and, and there has been some discussion about the, the, uh, the infrastructure bill, which was passed a year ago. Um, that bill outlines a lot of expenditures. Uh, as I recall, uh, 300,000 miles of, of highway, uh, bridges, the uh, uh, work on uh, water infrastructure and in municipalities. There, I think on the on the blueprint is also uh, electrical transmission, beefing up uh, electrical transmission between states to to encourage uh, renewable uh, energy, electrical generation. So, so how does how does the NIB, and also the fact that uh, thanks to uh, Arizona Senator Kirsten Sinema, uh, she, she succeeded in stripping all the taxes out of, the, out of that infrastructure bill. So currently it appears that maybe 90% of, of that massive bill is gonna be financed with national debt, with, with, with uh, T-bonds. So, are you looking at the NIB to be a supplemental entity or to maybe expand and localize uh, the infrastructure projects? Is it, is it a finance entity that will, that will help to, to relieve some of that coming, uh, uh, you know, additional national debt that will be created as these projects unfold? Um, I, I, you know, can you can you can you flesh that out a little bit for me? Sure, uh, Nomi, uh, if you uh, wouldn't mind taking that. Yeah. So, so, so the idea, and um, it, it um, is is part of what was um, alluded to in Alfaco's slides, is that you're augmenting 
that $1.2 trillion bipartisan infrastructure act. So, so, so the idea is, is that if you go around, um, and I've done it on a very limited basis, I, I know that Alfek and the team has gone to a lot more people um, in, in, in Washington than I have, but if, if you actually ask two very basic questions to people in Congress, like what, what would you do if you had a magic wand like in your, in your you know, state? Um, and what do you think the biggest problem is? They're all, gonna, they're all gonna have like a list of infrastructure projects that they you know, relate to infrastructure, lists that they wanna do. And then they're gonna say, there's either too much red tape or there's not enough money to get it done. So, so, so taking all that together, um, even though there's been this, this, this massive allocation and sort of funding mechanism through the Infrastructure Act, it doesn't get to completion of a lot of the biggest projects. And so it's, it, it, it in itself is like seed money. So the NIB would basically use existing treasury debt, again, like $30.5 trillion and counting, um, would deploy a portion of that um, and, and use that basically as, as a swap into funding for the infrastructure projects that will also get funded by components of the Infrastructure Act. So it is a way to, to just answer your question simply of augmenting what's already there in order to alleviate this, like, well, we don't have enough money to finish it. And we have to keep on going back to the will to get projects up um, to the well to get projects approved every single time there's like a midterm election. You know, so the idea is to basically have something that exists throughout all that horse trading that can happen um, and, and, and keep things going and actually get things completed. Uh, it, Professor, uh... Hockey. Uh, the thing is, uh, if you go back as an example uh, of what we did during World War II to be able to do that, where we financed everything, et cetera, it was a lending program. It wasn't a spending program. And what we've done so far in Congress is spend, and this is lend. So can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I think I'll, I'll essentially just be sort of um, footnoting Elfeka, who I think quite put it quite well, along with Nomi. Um, the difference about the banking model is precisely the fact that these are projects that are remunerative. And what you do then is you keep basically recycling the capital, right? So you, you, you put capital into a project, the project proves remunerative in one way or another. The bank that does the initial investing is accordingly repaid, not only what it lent out, but some margin above that. And then it recycles that back uh, into further projects. And so it sort of grows and grows and grows. And we have you know, relatively recent experience uh, with this, financially speaking. Uh, and again, the, the, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which is maybe the coolest financial institution that most people have never heard about, is such a great case in point. I mean, this was a fabulously successful, fabulously profitable institution, except that it's a little bit misleading to call it profitable since all of the profits were public profits, right? All of this money was either recycled into further projects or was returned to the US Treasury, that is to say, back to the citizenry. Um, so, you know, we, we've known at least since Hamilton's first uh, observations on the kind of alchemy or miracle of banking when it's done right, that really well-chosen projects end up basically being remunerative. They end up basically being not costs, but ultimately benefits, right? And the real question then just becomes, who gets those benefits? And if we're talking about a public institution like a national infrastructure bank, it's the public that gets those benefits, right? It's, it's, these are socialized benefits in effect um, because it's socialized expenditures in the first place, right? Um, there are some things we just do better um, collectively. Uh, there are some things we do better individually. Uh, it seems to me that anytime you're talking about a national project, you're by definition talking about a collective project. And that means something that has to be in some way organized and coordinated at the national level, and then also in some way financed at the national level, even if you are levering the strengths of individuals, including individual firms and individual workers in those firms. Thank you very much. Uh, Roger Meadows, you're up next. You're on mute. Yeah, all right, now, um, so I just want to, would like to re-emphasize re what I said last time. I heard a lot. Uh, I heard a lot as to how corporations can benefit from a national infrastructure bank, but if you really want to ramp up American-made manufacturing, worker cooperatives would be a better fit due to the fact that when the workers own their labor and shared ownership of the company, 
they are less likely to outsource their manufacturing jobs out of their community, state, and country. This is most likely due to them knowing this will put them on the unemployment line should they outsource. Therefore, the National Infrastructure Bank should show preference in helping to build, start, and partner with worker cooperatives first before seeking out partnerships with corporations where at the top of those corporations, they are always concerned about making a profit and less likely to treat their workers fairly, at least with workers fairly, at least with worker cooperatives, you solve the workers' rights issue and the outsourcing issue. Also, when the workers, when the worker owners come from the community, they are less likely to disturb and poison their drinking water, air quality, and soil, and putting their community and environment at risk. Because they live, because they live there, unlike a corporation where the owners don't even live in a community, state, or in, even in the country. So I, that was also addressing what um, someone was asking about. How know me when they asked her about how can we make sure that it's ecologically friendly and all of that. So it's not really a question. It was just that I just I wanted to reemphasize. Thank you very much for those comments, uh, Richard Arena. Thanks uh, once again for a very interesting uh, presentation. Um, I, I used to, I was a member of the um, associate of the, on the board of uh, U.S. High Speed Rail Association. In fact, I gave a presentation to several people in this group on high speed rail as uh, an aspirational project. I guess the question I have right now is the 800 uh, pound gorilla in the room. Um, the Fed just raised uh, their interest rate by 75 basis points yesterday. Uh, Chairman Powell wasn't very convincing when he said that he wouldn't be that far, that it wouldn't be that high in the, going forward, especially since the producer price inflation rate's 10.8%. The question I have is, does this affect the calculus for the NIB in terms of does that make it less, less or more viable with rates like that, number one? And as someone right now who's involved in the housing and the community association industry in Florida, even Florida growing as fast as it is, we're starting to see a slowdown right now as these rates are causing people to reconsider. So do we have to change our messaging? Do we have to change our calculus in terms of the NIB? Uh, Nomi, would you like to take that question? I was just not, I mean, that, that's, an, that's an excellent question. Um, and, and it's definitely worth, you know, taking apart, I mean, in a, in a, detailed way because it, it's true the cost of debt the cost of borrowing is getting higher right now while the fed's pivoting into a more hawkish mode um, and that means borrowing in order to create produce develop complete will become more expensive than it was you know, a year or two years ago and, and, and that's true but that's kind of also one of the um, things that have has a benefit through a national infrastructure bank because the idea there is everything that you're cycling through from the standpoint of financing or funding or borrowing in order to basically produce longer term development and keep projects going until they're actually completed and give back um yeah, give back to the public, basically you know, create a better foundation of the overall economy for everyone so that we're actually more insulated from, again, supply shocks externally or some of the things we've just gone through. Um, it does actually relate to a better use now of the National Infrastructure Bank. It means it can keep up with the cost of financing in order to be around and to complete projects rather than things getting abandoned because the funding is all of a sudden too expensive or, or non-existent. And I think it was Carolyn's point, which is interesting about, um, I just was reading right now in, in the chat, which is interesting um, is, and something I was saying before is that you don't have to fight over funding all the time because the funding is basically related to um, you know, what's, what's already existing. And if the cost of, of, of debt increases, well, that's okay because it's basically filtering through a national infrastructure bank that's already committing it to projects that will be ongoing. So it's project completion based. Um, that's how the returns come in. And that necessitates being flexible with whatever monetary policy is and however much it costs to, to produce. You're almost locked in to finishing those projects that have long-term value. Um, and, and, and the whole thing about what's happening now, housing going down, you know, basically being hit and everything else, those are shorter term um, events that are going to happen anyway. But this is about the longer term value of, of, of basically, you know, renovating the country. Okay. I, could I add something really quick here? Um, yep. maybe another way to sort of think of the NIB, I think, in comparison to what we have now 
is basically the financing of production in, in this country is, is kind of like a, an old messy leaky carburetor, uh, whereas an NIB is more like a sort of fuel injection fueling system. Uh, what I mean by that is that in order basically to kind of keep the unemployment rate from getting too low, the Fed has to stimulate um, the economy through basically emission as, uh, of as much money as necessary. And that a lot of that then ends up flowing toward either uh, hyper speculation on Wall Street or in other sort of inflationary ways. It's, it's a little bit like burning down your neighbor's house in order to warm your own, right? You might get <laughs> right by doing that, but you're burning down a house and doing it because you're not really being very efficient and sort of aiming the heat, so to speak. Um, and that's kind of what the Fed has to do, right? Because it doesn't do kind of fuel injection type monetary policy. It tends to work with a very broad brush. And so in the longer term, everything that, that Nomi said just now is exactly right about the, the, the short and medium term. And in addition, in the longer term, what we're talking about is a kind of a reconfiguration of the way we do financing. And if we do that, the NIB, you can think of as a kind of I shouldn't use you know, fossil fuel metaphors since we're trying to move off of those, but if uh, basically a fuel injection sort of mode of finance is just a much more efficient mode and it's much less likely therefore to be inflationary over time than have been you know, Fed easing policies up to now. Uh, and if I could throw in one more point also just in response to Roger, because I think Roger Meadows' point was exceedingly important as well and, and deserves um, a, a bit of attention in its own right. Um, you know, one of the great, another great thing about the Second World War mobilization is that all of this federal money that was spent in order to mobilize came with strings attached, right? And so in addition to, right, a, a war housing corporation and a defense plant corporation and so forth, there was a new set of labor standards that were imposed as conditions on all firms that were going to be received federal funding to do this defense stuff. And if they didn't play ball, they got in trouble. I've got photographs. I, I kind of get off on these things. I've got photographs of, you know, CEOs of corporations who refuse to abide by the labor standards that the new dealers impose as conditions of receiving federal funding and financing for the war production stuff. Um, you know, and they were carried out of their plants by military officials and the plants were taken over by the, the government. It seems to me that first of all, we ought to do impose similar strings with any kind of, of, of financing that we're doing. And another string that we can attach or at least a preferential option that we can exercise is on behalf of worker owned firms or firms that have co-determination of the German style where they're half uh, employee determined and half shareholder determined. Um, not to be a shameless plugger, but I, the next book I have coming out later this year is called A Republic of Producers. And it's essentially about how to convert the economy across the board along the lines I think that Roger is, 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 is prescribing here. And I think that that's entirely integrable with you know a much bigger public role in investment across the board, including through uh, and an IB. So I, I just want to say special thanks to Roger for for uh, reminding us of that particular uh, point. Big up work the cooperatives. <laughs> yeah. Drive a cooperative, the co-op ride, competing against Uber and Lyft in New York City, baby. I'm with you. I'm gonna I'm gonna go right to your site. Thanks so much, nice. Roger. All right. All right. Um, I see. Ellen, go ahead. I just wanted to add that uh, the Federal Reserve only has control over the Fed funds rate, which is the rate at which banks borrow from each other. And they don't really borrow from each other anymore. I mean, I guess they also have control over the repo, the yeah. floor they put on the repo rate. But um, we don't need to, uh, it wouldn't necessarily affect the rate at which the NIB is borrowing, assuming we can get the depositors on board. If we can, like, if we can just pay them a little more than they're getting right now, which is pretty close to zero, at least in my bank account. Um, and if, you know, mobilize public banks, et cetera, uh, postal banks would be great. If we can get the deposits in, we don't need to be influenced by the, the increase in the interest rate. Are you sure? Right. I mean, we, we, we're not, I mean can, we really can't live as isolated that way. I mean, we're, we're connected. Well, in the, terms of the, with the federal but market, I mean, in terms the, of the borrowing of the, yeah. the NIB. The NIB works the, on the same concept as any commercial bank. It lives off of the difference between the interest it pays on low uh, cost uh, deposits and, and maybe getting some money from the Fed and what it lends out uh, as an interest rate on its loans. 
and it will lend at the treasury bond rate, which is the very lowest uh, rates around. That treasury bond rate is rising. So if the bottom rises up, the top will rise up too, and it lives off the difference between the two. The question is then whether these loans would be too expensive, not only for a, a, a mortgage borrower to buy, borrow from for a house, but for a state government to borrow for an infrastructure project. But don't forget, we're going to be giving out 30 year loans over the lifetime of projects. And then state and local governments will be paying back with less valuable dollars far into the future. Plus they'll be making much more revenues coming in because of higher growth. So altogether the picture will be looking at the health and the borrowing capacity of, the, of these borrowers, state and local governments. Um, but uh, altogether we still expect the whole environment for them to improve, whether there's inflation, whether there's a recession, or whether there's high interest rates, we work on. We can work on all any of those uh, features. All right, um, we have uh, a couple more questions. I want to try and get in real quickly if we can. Brittany Brim. The question is: um, Has Biden has Biden seen the NIB propol proposal and how and and have a new defense uh, plant uh, plant corporation to build more weapons for Ukraine? Um, I really don't know what Biden has seen uh, for for that right now. So that that's something that we might be able to get an answer for, but we don't have that answer right here to be able to talk about that. So we're going to move on. Last question we have is Dennis Montoya. Hello, everyone. It's good to see this kind of turnout. There are a few of us here from New Mexico. I'm one of uh, the New Mexico contingent. I am the immediate past state director of New Mexico LULAC, the League of United Latin American Citizens, and we have endorsed the National Infrastructure Bank. And that brings me to my question. Uh, the information presented in this session is of great interest to me because our resolution out of New Mexico will be presented uh, next month in San Juan, Puerto Rico to the National Plenary of LULAC, the nationwide organization. And uh, we're, we're hoping for an adoption at the national level of what we have adopted here in New Mexico. I'll tell you what the concern that has been voiced repeatedly is, and that is, will there be adequate representation of our constituent community at the community level, at the decision-making level, and at all levels of the National Infrastructure Bank? Um, I noticed when Ruth was presenting that her background uh, looked an awful lot like a pyrocumulus cloud. That's a huge weather system that develops above massive forest fires. Well, we've just had the largest one in state history burn through my home county and Dr. Pablo V. Hill's home county. And I don't know, most Americans are aware of these wildfires, but I don't know if most Americans are aware that these are some of the poorest counties in the United States. These are counties that have been economically disadvantaged forever, counties in New Mexico and counties in Mississippi vie for first place in that category. Before New Mexico LULAC endorsed the NIB, we insisted on assurances that we would have adequate representation at all levels and adequate uh, access. Well, that's even access to funds, access to, um, to the economic advantages that come with the NIB. That's even more so now. The communities that have been decimated and more than 400 structures have burned to the ground, farms and ranches uh, have, have been left uh, completely destroyed. These communities are some of the poorest communities in the United States. So I want to know, what can I say in Puerto Rico next month to convince the national that they should get behind this proposal? Um, and I would also like to know how the NIB can work in conjunction with FEMA, with the Red Cross, with other disaster relief agencies in addressing this kind of natural disaster, the kind that is happening around 
Yellowstone right now, the kind that just swept through us in New Mexico. Uh, I don't care who answers my questions, but that's what they are. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to let Alfeca take the first stab at this because she knows the bill the best. Right. So Alfeca. Great. Thank you very much. So there are several uh, ways that um, uh, communities like yours have access to um, provisions from the National Infrastructure Bank. First of all, on the board of directors, uh, there are uh, 25 board of direct, uh, uh, directors on the board, and some of them must come from state legislature groups. Some of them must come from disadvantaged um, community groups. Uh, and we make sure that, uh, that there's full representation. The second uh, way that this happens is the legislation requires that there's fair access uh, for jobs from the NIB, for business opportunities, for disadvantaged business opportunities. Uh, third, there, it requires that there's geographic uh, dispersion of the uh, project loans. Uh, we even use the Jim Clyburn 10 20 30 rule uh, to define areas that would uh, get 10% of the resources or loans uh, where 20% of the population has been living below the poverty line for more than 30 years. And, and by the way, uh, New Mexico is one of the poorest states in the country. It's very a very large land mass and very sparsely populated. We want to absolutely make sure that New Mexico gets resources for broadband everywhere, for rural roads, for schools, for um, um, water resources. If the state doesn't receive these water resources, even the little bit of farming, which uses up 50% of the land mass in New Mexico will wither away. So all of these are high uh, uh, priorities for the bank. Um, the, 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 much of the legislation with the, possibly the exception of Native American lands is already in the uh, draft uh, legislation and we're going to add the tribal areas in the next round. And, and in addition to that, for very poor areas, the National Infrastructure Bank will use all of its excess resources that come in for loans that are that are not used up in meeting operational needs. It would put that those extra resources into a trust fund, and then give out uh, those loans uh, to uh, uh, rather than give out loans, it would give out grants to these very poor communities. And community development is one of the high priorities of the bank. This uh, is an area where. Uh, um, um, Bob can talk about how the Reconstruction Finance Corporation and the World War II mobilization did this the last time around. It's This is very much an RFC model where the RFC uh, lent into rural electrification, for example, people that couldn't uh, on the face of it Pay, afford to even pay back the loans. But out of the economic growth and the electrification process, uh, they grew faster uh, than would have been expected and all of those loans were paid back. And it's also a big move for cooperatives for those uh, localities to set up their own broadband cooperatives or rural housing cooperatives. Uh, any of those things can be financed with the bank. So the, uh, not only is this bill aimed at building all of the nation's infrastructure, but it wants to stimulate economic growth, supercharge economic growth, and make sure that we have equitable economic growth. So this will be the first infusions of investments into New Mexico since the last Reconstruction Finance Corporation. Uh, Professor Hockett, you got anything else to add? Yeah, I mean, it's it, basically anything I ever think of, of saying Alfeca has already thought of. And, and probably, <laughs> but I mean, I'll just I'll just sort of, um, you know, underscore what she said. I mean, I, the first thought I had actually when, when you when you posed your your questions and, and thoughts, Dennis, was uh, in a way we this is sort of the other half of the RFC, as it were. There's, there's sort of pre-war RFC and then there's the during the war RFC. The pre-war RFC was all about rebuilding the country and also just building from scratch in places where there just wasn't any infrastructure, um, but then also rebuilding infrastructure that had been damaged or replacing obsolete infrastructure with better infrastructure. So it was a kind of a national development and national redevelopment project that the RFC was embarked upon um, you know, as part of the New Deal in the lead up to 1939. 
Uh, and then once it became clear that war was going to break out in, in Europe, it was clear that now it wasn't just a matter of rebuilding our basic capacities and infrastructures, but also sort of, you know, supercharging or, or, or hypercharging our productive capacities in particular industries. Um, and so you can sort of think, I suppose, then of the NIB as basically bringing into one period of time both phases of the RFC's life, right? The sort of uh, rebuilding, reconstruction phase on the one hand with the building anew and the sort of um, financing of transformational industries piece of it as well. So the, both the pre-war and the post-war RFC are sort of united into one, it seems to me, uh, in the NIB, um, at least in the incarnation that Alpeca and the um, NIB coalition are, 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 are advocating. All right. Uh, well, I want to thank everybody for uh, their attention, for taking the time out of their day. I especially want to thank uh, Nobi Prince uh, for her uh, uh, presentation. She has a book that's uh, out there. Uh, if you want to see more, The Permanent Distortion, uh, How the Financial Markets Abandoned the Real Economy Forever, uh, that's coming out in October. Uh, hey, October 11th. That's my anniversary. That's a great there day. There you go. <laughs> Plans. So, uh, Tommy, we you saw you on those way. YouTube commercials. I seen yeah. you. Okay. <laughs> and then uh, I want to thank uh, Professor Hockett for his insight to be able to do it. I know he's uh, he's got uh, things that are happening here shortly. He's going to be talking about uh, that other half that he covered earlier on. And, and I think that makes a, a lot of sense for us to be able to realize that they, they might need to go uh, together to be able to make that happen. Uh, Ellen Brown, thank you so much for uh, bringing us your perspective on the public banking. And, and uh, of course, we have to thank Alfeca, who always uh, has all the answers to be able to, to make this thing kind of go together. Uh, with that being said, uh, the one thing I would uh, say is we have a couple of things that uh, <clears throat> everyone should uh, uh, kind of understand we the upcoming summer blockbuster uh, <laughs> resolution <laughs> these things here these are actually uh, um, we are making presentations and resolutions at all of these uh, uh, things and so uh, it takes money to be able to advertise at this and we're trying to get this in front of more and more people uh, please if you have an opportunity please be able to uh, share uh, some of that wealth that you have to be able to help us to be able to get this message out. This is something that we need to be able to do. Uh, and thanks again for everybody who was in here. Don't forget about the upcoming ones we have. Uh, we appreciate all of you so much. And uh, uh, with that, I'm going to sign off for tonight. Have a great when evening. When is the video going to be available? When, yes, it will be. It will be on our website. When? Two weeks? Um, Give the guy a break. <laughs> it, he'll he'll be here. It'll be up there shortly, and uh, we will be. If, if you you signed up for this, you'll get notification when it's on. That's all I can tell you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>